In this video, we'll have a look at how risk and uncertainty can be built into decision making by considering various techniques the decision maker may use, such as expected values, risk adjusted discount factor, payback, and simulations. We'll consider sensitivity analysis and certainty equivalence in the next video. Technically speaking, risk and uncertainty are different things. Risk is quantifiable. We're dealing with known possibilities and known or estimable probabilities. An example of risk will be tossing a coin. We don't know whether it's going to be a head or a tail, but we know it's going to be one of those with a 50-50 chance of each. With uncertainty, either we don't know the probabilities and or we may not know all the possible outcomes. This is therefore more difficult to quantify. Often one person's risk is another person's uncertainty. If an individual has experience of a situation, they may well have an idea of what may happen and how likely it is to happen. This may not be the case if the situation is new to the individual. We often use the terms of risk and uncertainty interchangeably, but just bear in mind that technically they are different things. There are several ways of dealing with risk and uncertainty in decision making. Let's first consider the use of expected values. An expected value is an average. Suppose we're not certain what revenue will be next year. We think there's a 25% chance that it will be $100,000 and a 75% chance that it will be $200,000. The expected value for revenue next year is calculated like this. 25% times $100,000 plus 75% times $200,000 equals $175,000. If we were using expected values, we would use $175,000 as the figure for sales. This assumes a risk-neutral attitude. If the decision maker uses $175,000, from that point on they are no longer considering that sales could be as high as $200,000 or as low as $100,000. A little extreme perhaps, but imagine if the company will fail completely if sales were as low as $100,000. The decision maker, when using expected values, would therefore not be considering that there was a 25% chance of the company failing. Expected values are therefore a long-run average and are not suitable for one-off decisions. They're also highly dependent on the estimate of probabilities. Another approach that could be taken to deal with risk is to reflect it in the discount rate. Suppose a company's cost of capital is 10% but it's considering undertaking a project that is riskier than their average. Remember that the cost of capital is there to compensate investors for three things, interest, inflation and risk. So, if the project we're appraising is a higher risk than others, we can apply a higher discount rate, let's say 15%. It is possible to be more scientific than simply increasing it arbitrarily. More on this later in the course when we have a look at the marginal cost of capital for investment appraisal. Payback period gives us a measure of risk. A project with a short payback period can be considered to be less risky as the near future is more knowable than the distant future. We might be very concerned if it takes a long time to pay back as the conditions that the project operates under could change more dramatically in the longer term than is likely in the shorter term. Lastly in this short video let's consider simulations. When we put NPV calculations together we put our best estimates for what we think the cash flows will be into that calculation. For example for sales. These estimates are what is known as point estimates. They're a number being used to represent a range of possible values. If we have the information, it would be more accurate to replace these point estimates with a fuller description of that variable. For example, by replacing that number with a probability distribution. We may replace one or two numbers, or we may replace all of them with probability distributions. Don't panic. You're not going to be asked to do the maths of this in the exam, 
You just need to be aware of this as a technique and be prepared to explain it. If some of the point estimates are replaced with probability distributions, the natural conclusion of this is that there won't be a single number at the end of the calculation for NPV. The NPV itself will be a distribution, perhaps like this. The decision maker would need to consider the graph and make their decision based on that. We can see here that the expected or average NPV is $10,000 but the NPV could be higher or lower than this, depending on the value of the underlying variables. Although this technique is much more in-depth than using point estimates, it assumes you know the probability distributions, which we may well not do, given that we're dealing with the future. In this video, we have considered the various tools and approaches that we can use when building risk into our investment appraisal decisions. There are two more to look at, sensitivity analysis and certainty equivalence, and we consider these in the next video.